Let's clap our hands and give him praise. He alone is worthy. Come on, all over the house, lift your voice. What a great God. What a great God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Well, it is so good, so good to be back at Inland Lighthouse uh, right here in Rialto, California, right in the midst of all the craziness of our time. Amen. But God's got it all in control. Anybody believe that here today? God has it all in control. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Pastor said it's been a year and nine months, and it has, based on my my uh, my recollection and my records. I just told him I was glad I was back in his good graces. <laughs> Amen. I'm supposed to be here back in May, but uh, I decided to have a little bout with Rona, and so uh, she and I got over it real quick. That wasn't something I wanted to hang on to for a while. So I'm real safe, folks. You can't give me nothing. I can't give you nothing. Hallelujah. And so, <laughs> praise God. So, so, so glad to be here. And I think it's obvious. I don't really have to uh, talk about the, um, uh, the times that we live in, but they are crazy times. Unusual. I'm not going to call them unique because I don't think they're unique. I think they're just wild and woolly. Amen. But God's working in the midst of all of that. God's not surprised by anything. Nothing. I say God's not surprised by anything. It doesn't matter what the circumstances are. In fact, uh, we have, since I was here the last time, uh, I have been to Africa I've been to India twice, and there are incredible things that are happening in those on the continent of Africa, in the nation of India. In fact, I just got a report from one of our pastors in the country of Uganda, and he is starting this weekend the process of baptizing. We know he knows he has 127, and he said there's more people coming as he is baptizing people. Hallelujah. He, uh, he taught a couple of weeks ago, or maybe three or four weeks ago, to a group of churches, and that's where the 127 uh, came from, uh, that, that, that they wanted to be baptized, but because of the same situation there as it is here, they're having to adjust the plans and he's going to the different villages where these churches are from, baptizing these people. He said, so it's not just 127. He said, every, every church is more coming in wanting to be baptized. Amen. Three or four weeks ago, he baptized eight Trinitarian pastors in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> Praise God. Our bishop in the uh, nation of Malawi, I keep getting reports from him. Uh, where, and I have pictures where he's taking them out to the water, baptizing entire churches, baptizing pastors, baptizing bishops. I'm telling you, God is doing it. He is doing it. Thank God. A number of weeks ago, I had a young man from the, from the nation of Gambia uh, in Africa that contacted me, and we began to communicate. A young man's about 20 or 21 years old. Parents were killed in an automobile accident two years ago. He was left to raise his uh, eight-year-old brother and 13-year-old sister. And so we were communicating, talking back and forth. And, and so I gave him a Bible study by way of, uh, we, had, we had, were able to do it uh, by FaceTime or on WhatsApp video. And, and he saw his need of uh, repentance and baptism in Jesus' name. And so I'm 5,000 miles away, Bishop. I didn't know what to do. I just said, take your 13-year-old sister down to the water with you. Take your telephone, put it on video so I can see you in the water. And I said, I'm going to say to you in the name of Jesus Christ, I baptize you, Madhu, and I want you to go under the water. And that's what he did. If y'all got a better way to do it, you let me know. 
Now I realize, I realize that, that, that I could have prayed for the Lord to do for me what he did for Philip. And that would just catch me away and put me over there with him. But my problem with that prayer is when I read the book of Acts, I don't see what happened after Philip baptized that man. I don't know if he had to walk back home or I don't see where the Lord caught him away and put him back where he came from. So I didn't want to pray that prayer. I just said, let's do it this way for right now. And a few days later, we were on another FaceTime call, Bible study. We had a prayer meeting and received the gift of the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And so I'm just telling you that God is in control. And everything's going to be all right. Anybody believe that this morning? Do you really, really believe that God has it in control? Hallelujah. Thank God. It is a delight to be here. I give honor to your good pastor and his dear wife and family. Also the bishop and Sister Booker. We love these and we appreciate them very much. And uh, I heard the announcement about the continuing services for the next two weeks. And I thought, yeah, they got the younger guys coming in. They want to get the old man out of the way. Amen. And so I'm just going to tell you, I'm just going to tell you right now, Cody Marks is coming next weekend. James Talley the following weekend. We're going to have a great time tonight and to Wednesday night this morning. And I'm just, you might as well make the best of it because it's going to be all downhill from here. <laughs> Hallelujah. And you can tell Cody Marks I said that. <laughs> Amen. I love and appreciate and respect very highly both of the men that are coming. And uh, I'm just happy to be here. Thank God. I want to read today from the book of Psalms, chapter 84, beginning with verse number 1. Psalms 84, verse 1. I am... I have been given the liberty to do what I feel, to preach what the Holy Ghost put in my heart as a burden. And so I am going uh, to do exactly that today. Psalms 84, verse 1. How amiable are thy tabernacles, O Lord of hosts. My soul longeth, yea, even fainteth for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh cry out for the living God. Yea, the sparrow hath found an house, and the swallow a nest for herself, where she may lay her young, even thine altars, O Lord of hosts, my King and my God. Blessed are they that dwell in thy house. They will still be praising thee. Blessed is the man whose strength is in thee, in whose heart are the ways of them. I want to preach a little while this morning on this subject, the essentiality of church. Amen. Now, I didn't say the essentiality of the church. That's a different message altogether. Amen. Not the institution, but the action of church, the essentiality. The word essentiality means a basic trait or a set of traits that define and establish the character of something. And so we're talking about the essentiality of church. We're talking about the traits that define the character of the church. Hallelujah. Would you clap your hands and give him praise one more time? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. God bless you. You can be seated. It is said that the 23rd Psalm is the most popular of the Psalms. That the 103rd Psalm is the most joyful of Psalms. The 119th, they tell us, is the most deeply experimental Psalm. And then, of course, when you look at Psalms 51, it is often noted as the most plaintive. And that, of course, being the result of uh, the prayer that David prayed because of the sin that he had committed. But this psalm that I have read from, the 84th Psalm, 
Uh, they class it as one of the most sweetest of the Psalms of peace. And it is referred to as the pearl of Psalms. And, and so the reason uh, for this is because that it speaks directly to that of Zion's sacred feast. When you do a little research or study regarding the people of God, and this is, uh, I believe, confirmed by various passages in the Old Testament, uh, that yearly there were pilgrimages that were made to the tabernacle, the house of God. And they were a grand feature. These pilgrimages was a grand feature of Jewish life. Families would journey together from wherever they lived in the land of Canaan, coming to Jerusalem where the tabernacle was. Uh, as they would journey down the road, other families would join together and they would uh, develop bands of people that would grow as they went uh, from one village to the next on their way to the house of the Lord. They would camp at various places along the way. As they journeyed, they would sing in unison as they traveled down the road. They would toil together over the hills and they would journey through the rough places as they went along. And all the while, they were storing up happy memories which would never be forgotten regarding those journeys to the house of the Lord. Amen. So what you note whenever you read all of this and, and, you, and you study it in scripture uh, about these various uh, pilgrimages and their journeys uh, of different ones uh, in the word of God, what you'll note is that the journey was not always the most pleasant journey. And the journey was not always the easiest of journeys, but there was a desire to get to the house of God. What superseded everything else was where they were going and not the journey that they were having to make on the way to where they were going. Amen. I'm just going to tell you that every now and then there's a few rough places you have to travel over to get to the house of God. Every now and then you're going to find yourself climbing a mountain to get to the house of worship. And you may even have to travel through a low, long valley to get to where your heart yearns to be. But I'm going to tell you, it's worth the trip. I don't care what you have to go through to get to the house of God. It's worth the journey. It's worth the trip, whatever it takes. I don't care what I got to deal with. It doesn't matter what the situation is. Doesn't matter what I got to travel over. Doesn't matter what I got to barrel through. I got to get to church. I got to get to the house of worship. I must get in the presence of my God. Somebody clap your hands and praise him right now. Hallelujah. In fact, the very heading in my Bible uh, over, the, over this particular psalm is headed in, on this wise, longing for the sanctuary. Longing for the sanctuary. I don't know how you feel this morning in this place, but there's something about the house of God that it doesn't take me very many days before something wells up inside of me and says, I got to get back to the sanctuary. I got to get to a prayer room. I got to get back to a house of worship. I got to get to the place where I know that I can receive that which I need from my soul. Oh, hallelujah. Because it doesn't matter what kind of situation you're facing. It doesn't matter what the circumstances of your life are. It's important that you be in the house of worship. Psalm, now just let me preach for you, to you for a few minutes. I'm going somewhere. 
Amen. I know we're all dealing with various situations, and I know that we're dealing with things that we have to do, and I understand all of that. I, I, I can't qualify everything I'm preaching here this morning. Don't take some things that I feel to say in the Holy Ghost as an attack on whatever methodology or whatever we're having to do to overcome some of the hurdles that we have to overcome to have church. I just come to remind you this morning that there's got to be something inside of us that says I don't care what I have to do. It doesn't matter what I got to go through. I'm going to be there. I'm going to be in the house. I've got to touch my God. Amen. In fact, there's a sister, there's a sister psalm to Psalms 84, and it's Psalms 48. And the psalmist wrote this beautiful for situation. The joy of the whole earth is Mount Zion. And I recognize that when they wrote that, that it was referencing the geographical location of Jerusalem set upon the seven hills. I have no doubt that that's what they were referencing, but there is a spiritual application that you and I can grasp a hold of and understand that it doesn't matter what the situation is. Zion is beautiful for that situation. If you're in trouble, Zion is beautiful for you. If you've got problems that are insurmountable, Zion is a beautiful place for you. It's beautiful for your situation. If your family's falling apart, it's beautiful for that situation. If you're struggling with sin, Zion is beautiful for that situation. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Beautiful for situation. The joy of the whole earth is Mount Zion. I read in Judges chapter 5. Verse 6 and 7, Deborah, who penned the words to this song after the battle that was fought, that was such a very important battle that God needed the victory to be won. In fact, it was so important that he allowed Deborah to lead in the battle when it wasn't even within the parameters of God's perfect will that a woman lead in the battle. But because it was so important and because men would not step up to the plate, then there was a woman that said, I'll go lead the battle. Amen. And when she wrote uh, the words of that song, she described the hour in which that battle was fought. She said, in the days of Shamgar, the sons of Anath, in the days of Jael, the highways were unoccupied and the travelers walked through byways. The inhabitants of the villages ceased. They ceased in Israel. So she's describing a set of circumstances uh, very much like what even we're having to deal with in our time today. But she's alluding to the fact that the robbers that were on the highways that made it a dangerous place to travel and those Whatever, whatever the circumstances were that created that this negative situation, she said, all of that was going on in the land of Israel until I, Deborah, arose, and I arose a mother in Israel. In other words, she said, I looked at the situation around me, and I decided somebody has got to do something about this. Somebody has got to step up to the plate. Can I tell in the lighthouse uh, that we live in a wicked hour and we live in a troublesome time. God needs somebody to step up to the plate in 2020 and say, oh yes, I'll give a Bible study. Oh yes, I'll witness to somebody. Oh yes, I'll be in the prayer room. Oh yes, I'll be a mother in Israel that will rise up. Amen. I'll be one of those that will step up to the plate in a critical hour and do what is necessary. So when you look at verse number one of this psalm, the writer pens these words, how amiable are thy tabernacles, O Lord of hosts. How lovely, how wondrous is what he's saying. 
The word amiable there means lovely or it means wondrous. How lovely are your tabernacles. How wondrous is the house of the Lord. This man that wrote this was not pinning these words merely for himself. I understand that this particular uh, uh, psalm is one of 11 psalms that were written either by or for the sons of Korah. The sons of Korah had been estranged from the house of God for a period of time because of the sin of their father, the rebellion against Moses. And so you will notice as you read the Psalms written either by or for the sons of Korah that is consistently speaking about the hunger, the desire, the thirst for the house of God. They had been estranged. They basically were not allowed to participate but there was something in their heart that said I long for this the tabernacles of God are a wondrous place they're a lovely place there's no place like the house of God I'm going to tell you right now you can't get this at Walmart and you can't get it at Lowe's and you can't get it at some fine restaurant somewhere what you get in the house of God cannot be gotten from any other place anywhere come on I wish I had some help here this morning I know it's Sunday morning and I know every one of us are sick and fed up and tired of all the pressure and the stress of the hour but there's got to be something that rises up in us that says oh God there's no place like your church there's no place like the house of God there's no place like the sanctuary of worship I said, no place. Does anybody believe that today? No place like the house of God. No place like walking inside the sanctuary. Going to the house of God was a big deal in those days. It was something to be greatly desired. And I'm just going to tell you, church, I don't ever want to lose You hear me? I never, ever want to lose my desire to be in the house of God. I'm going to tell you why. This is my refuge. This is where I find my peace. This is where I find my joy. This is where I find my contentment. Woo, hallelujah. The second verse, the psalmist said, my soul longs, yea, even faints for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh cry out for the living God. Something inside, something within my spirit that says, I cannot do without it. I don't ever want to live without it. I don't ever want to try to exist without it. I wish somebody to thank God for the place of worship. Thank God for an opportunity to worship. I feel like there's some people in this house this morning that have said within your heart in the past few weeks, I'll never take the house of God for granted ever again in my life. I will never take the opportunity to worship with the saints of God ever again for granted. I'm going to cherish it. I'm going to love it. I'm going to love it. I'm going to live it. Hallelujah. Unfortunately, there's some in our world that have to be forced to go to church. But the psalmist here is crying out for it. Amen. I've traveled 
been blessed to travel in many parts of the world and probably all but about one or two of the states in the United States. And traveling and journeying, and Bishop can uh, agree, and I'm sure many of you would know what I'm saying is about is true. It's not just about right, it is right. That when you travel around, you'll see especially churches in villages and towns that have been there for 100 years or 200 years that they have on the top of the building what they call a belfry. And there's still many places where they are still in existence and they're still being used. But inside that belfry, there is a giant bell that is hung. And every Sunday morning, at the appropriate hour, somebody begins to ring the bell. The sole purpose for ringing the bell in the belfry of the church in the village was to call the people in the surrounding community to a time of worship. The bell ringing was to remind them church will begin in just a little while. You need to show up in the house of God. But this psalmist that I've read to you about didn't need the clatter of bells from the belfry to ring him in to the house of worship. He carried a bell down inside of him. He carried the ringing of a bell in his heart. Oh, glory to God. Because you see, friend, a holy appetite for God is a better call to worship than a full chime of bells ringing in a belfry somewhere. When you got a hunger for God, you know you got to go where you can find him. You know you got to go to the place where you know when you walk in there, you're entering into his gates with thanksgiving. You're coming into his courts with praise. You're entering into his very presence with singing. Amen. I'm afraid the bell has gone silent in the heart of some. Can I challenge us this morning at Inland Lighthouse, don't let the bell go silent in your life. Woo, hallelujah. I said, don't let the bell go silent. Don't make your pastor feel like he's got to call you on Saturday night to make sure you're going to be in church on Sunday morning. Hallelujah. You need to wake up on Sunday morning with a bell ringing in your heart. Wake up on Sunday morning with a bell ringing in your spirit. Something saying, it's time to go to church. It's time to get to the house of worship. It's time to get to the sanctuary of praise. I got to get to Jesus. I said, I got to get to Jesus. I got to get to worship. I got to get to the house of praise. I can't do without it. My soul longs, yea, even faints for the courts of the Lord. I'm sorry, I don't have an attitude, take it or leave it. Amen. I don't have an attitude that says, okay, if I can, okay, if I can't. Oh, no. If I can't, there's got to be something inside of me that says, as soon as I can, as soon as I get the chance, as soon as the opportunity presents itself, you can count on me. Praise the Lord. Amen. Bishop, I know you feel like I feel. I give honor to our pastors that have had to, 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 to do all they could to navigate the church through the troubled waters of these past few months. Come on, church. Aren't you thankful for your pastor? Come on. Are you thanking God for a man? Go ahead. I said, you can stand and give him a hand. That's all right. He's, he's, he's worthy of it. that have had to take the hand that they were dealt 
and try to figure out how am I going to work this? How am I going to, what are we going to do? Because you see, you've got to understand if there's anything that he had in his heart, it was a desire to not lose anybody. It was a desire that nobody would fall by the wayside. Because he understood that, that, that even in the best of times, uh, there's people living on the edge. That the only thing that keeps them is the opportunity to be in the house of God. The only thing that preserves their, their little bit of faith uh, is that they do show up for the house of God. Uh, and he's wondering, God, what are we going to do about these situations? How are we going to help them? How are we going to keep them from falling by the wayside? Uh, I'm going to tell you, friend, uh, you need to thank God. You were not the pastor during this time because the pressure upon our pastors has been absolutely unbelievable. Huh? Amen. What I'm preaching this morning, you please understand, I'm not going on the attack. Amen. But I do feel some things in the Holy Ghost because I want to tell you in times like this, the enemy will take advantage. The enemy will take an opportunity because you see, he's an opportunist. And he doesn't care what the opportunity is. He will use that opportunity to try to destroy your walk with God, your faith in God, your confidence in God. And all I've come to tell you here this morning is very simply that there's an essentiality to church that we can never lose. We can never let go of. That there's got to be a love there. There's got to be something that says, I may have to deal with what I'm dealing with right now. And I may have to face what I'm facing right now. But there's one thing about it the day will come it's going to change and when it does I'm not going to be on the wayside I'm not going to be a backslider I'm not going to be one that gives up amen, amen. I understand what's even going on here pastor's already informed me so I, I, I understand. So please, just I'm, I, I know I'm, I'm kind of walking on thin ice and I'm treading, hey amen, on, in, in deep waters right now. But I know what I feel in the spirit. Hallelujah. And to all of those that are at home this morning and you're listening by, by, by way of, of the internet, God bless you if you're not able to be here. When you get here tonight, we're going to have church with you also. Come on, church. But I'm just going to tell you, we weren't made for online worship. We weren't made for online church. We weren't made for social distancing church. That's not what we were made for. Now, when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all together in one place. When suddenly there came a sound from heaven. They were together. They were together. Yeah. Amen. I got troubled here several weeks ago in my spirit because of what we were having to do, what we were what, we, what was necessary in many situations. And I got troubled in my spirit. And I got to thinking about how easy it would be to change our habits. Where church is concerned. Come on, can I preach to you? I'm, I'm just, I'm feeling some liberty right now. I feel like some folks are loosening up in this house. And so I, I went and did some looking. I did some reading. And my, my question that I asked was, how long does it take to develop a new habit? And, and whenever I, I did reading of several different writers, and the conclusion is this, that it takes approximately 66 days to develop a new habit. Now that is just a little over two months. Amen. We've been more than two months in this. Can I get a witness? Amen. Now, now they did say that you could develop a new habit 
in as little as 21 days. But that as a general rule, the average is 66 days to develop a new habit. And I thought about how easy it is for some folks to get up on Sunday morning about 930, slip on their robe and make them a hot cup of coffee and go sit down at the dinner table and flip the phone on, turn it on, amen, and hit the button and, and they're in church. And how easy it would be to get used to that, to acclimate yourself to a new habit. Preach on, Brother Bass. Hallelujah. Amen. Just develop a new habit. It's just, I don't want to go through all the trouble of getting up and shaving my face and combing my hair and washing all the sleep out of my eyes and getting myself ready, put my suit on and my, my necktie and my, my coat, get to the church and, and, and got to drive and I got to do all of that. It's just so much easier. I'm going to tell you what, friend, this whole business of living for God was never designed to be easy. It was designed... It was designed around a thing called commitment, around a thing called consecration, around something called devotion and loyalty. Well, hallelujah. What they did say was this. They said that the development of a new habit is dependent upon the strength of the old habit. I got an old habit, Bishop. I got an old habit, Pastor. My old habit's going to church. Woo! Hallelujah. I was born between two Sundays. Amen. The first Sunday of my life, I was in church, sitting on my mama's lap. And I want you to know, if a Sunday from that point on, there may be enough that I could count on five fingers that I hadn't been in church. But I'm going to tell you, I got an old habit going to church. I got an old habit of going to the sanctuary. I got it. I don't know how you feel, but I don't want to break this old habit. I'm not looking for a new way. I'm not looking for a new habit. One thing have I desired of the Lord, and that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to behold the beauty of the Lord, to inquire in his temple, for in the time of trouble he will hide me in his pavilion. In the secret of his tabernacle shall he hide me. He shall set me upon a rock. One thing. I said one thing. If I don't seek for anything else, I'm seeking for one thing. Church is a big deal to me. Huh? I said church is a big deal to me. Amen. Saturday, Saturday a week ago, I happened to be in Florida with my son for a few days. We buried the oldest member of our church. Started going to our church in 1958. 88 years old. Passed away. His dear wife, 86, I think she was, leaned over his casket at the funeral home and said, Jim, I'll see you in a few days. And we buried him on Sunday. And Sister Walker, that was sun on Saturday. On Sunday, she was in church Sunday morning. On Monday afternoon, they called the ambulance. They picked her up. She never regained consciousness. And she died. He's having her funeral this coming Saturday. Been in our church since 1958. In the middle of the worst of situation because of their health and, and because of their, 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 the fact that they were very vulnerable to the, to the situation, to the, to the virus. They, they were not in church. They, they couldn't come. My son recommended they stay at home because they were very vulnerable. Their, their issues, their health was not good. 
But one day they drive up in the parking lot and happen to find him there. And they said, we just had to come by the church. And pastor, we want to know when can we come back to church? Woo, hallelujah. I don't know how you feel. I don't know. Maybe I'm, maybe I'm just pounding away too much on this point here this morning. I don't really think I am. Because there's something about the house of God that when it burns inside your spirit. Don't shut the door to me. I want to be in the house of worship. Amen. Psalm 73 and 1. The psalmist said, Truly God is good to Israel, even to such as are of a clean heart. But as for me, my feet were almost gone. My steps had well nigh slipped. For I was envious of the foolish when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. The psalmist was saying, When I look at Israel, they're blessed. And when I look at the wicked, they're blessed. They're prospering. But as for me, my feet were almost gone. My steps had well nigh slipped. I was almost gone because everybody else was being blessed but me. Everybody else was getting their needs met but me. It seemed like I was caught in the middle. Everybody else on the right and the left, they were, they were getting their prosperity. They were being blessed. But I was, I was slipping because... I got the feeling like I had cleansed my, my heart in vain. And I washed my hands in innocency. All the day long I've been plagued. My enemy has constantly chasing me every morning. He said, when I thought to know this, it was too painful for me. In other words, I found myself in a circumstance where I didn't even know if I could continue on because all the circumstances of my life and everything I was dealing with and all the trouble in my, in my anxiety it was, it was beyond my ability to handle it. It was far too painful. But verse 17, he said, until, until I went into the sanctuary of God, then understood I, then understood I their end. Now I'm going to tell you who he was talking about when he said understood I their end. He was saying I understood the end of the wicked and I understood the end of the righteous and I made my mind up. I think I'll stick with the righteous. I think I'll hang on. I think I'll hang out. I think I'll just keep right on keeping on. Because you see, there's something about the sanctuary that you get an understanding here you can't get anywhere else. That's why the psalmist screamed from the heart, from the end of the earth will I cry unto thee. When my heart is overwhelmed, lead me to that rock that is higher than I. When I have gone to the end of the earth, when I've gone as far as I can go, when I'm at my limit, lead me to the rock. When my heart is overwhelmed, when I don't know which way to turn, take me to the rock. Take me to the house. Amen. When Absalom had conspired and stolen the throne, of his father David. His father David had to flee for his life. And as King David is walking out of the city, there were those who brought the ark to him and said, here, take the ark with you. And David's words were this, carry back the ark of God into the city. And if I shall find favor in the eyes of the Lord, he will bring me again and show me both it and his habitation. Amen. If I found favor in God's eyes, he's going to bring me back to his habitation. I may be in a situation that's not of my choosing. I may be separated from, from the city I love and from the house I love. 
But if God's pleased with me, he'll bring me back. He will restore me. He will, I will return. Amen. We know that the subsequent events that took place, Absalom was killed in battle. And they come to get David to take him back to the city of Jerusalem to restore him to the throne. The writers or the compilers, I should say, of the chronological Bible, those that take the Bible and they take verses and chapters and they try to place them in chronological order. They place this particular statement, this Psalm of David, right after the death of Absalom when they were taking him back to Jerusalem. We use this verse to promote worship in church and nothing wrong with that everything's all right in that regard but this is when David was headed back to Jerusalem is when he made this statement I was glad when they said unto me let us go to the house of the Lord amen I was glad you know why he was glad because he realized God favored me God loved me enough to restore me and to bring me back to his house oh hallelujah Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. God favored me enough. He didn't say, I was glad when they said to me, let's go back to the throne room. Let's go back to purple robes and a royal crown and a golden scepter. Let's go back to pomp and circumstance. Let's go back to power and authority. That's not what he said. He said his greatest and chief desire was to go back to the house of God. When he got through with the battle, when the battle, it was over. He wanted to go back to church. He wanted to go back to worship. I'm almost finished. I'm trying. Hey, there's something about the pulpit here at Inland Lighthouse that just makes you want to preach. Ah. Amen. I want you to notice verse 3. Yay, the sparrow has found a house and a swallow a nest for herself where she may lay her young, even thine altars. O Lord of hosts, my king and my God. The sparrow, the sparrow has found a place. Found a house. You see, the sparrow is one of the smallest and most insignificant of the bird family. Just so small, you can hold it in the palm of your hand. In fact, some of them are so small, you can almost close your hand around the sparrow. It's such an insignificant creature. Amen. Such an insignificant. And this is what the writer was trying to convey. That the sparrow, the the insignificant, the one that, it's not the eagle with the broad wingspan. It's not the, the bird that has a massive wingspan that's the glory of the heavenlies. Oh no, he said, even the the smallest, even the insignificant has found a place, has found a house right around your altars. Glory to God. The swallow has found a place, a nest for herself that she may lay her young, a place she can bring her babies to, a place that she feels safe in. Hallelujah. I've come to tell you, friend, that when this psalmist made this statement, he was making it very clear that there's a place in the house of God for everybody. Oh, hallelujah. You don't have to be a king that sits upon a throne. You don't have to be the CEO of a massive corporation. You don't have to be some rich elite individual. God just looking for somebody. The most insignificant. Those that nobody counts as being worth very much. The God that we serve says, I got a place for you. You see, sometimes, sometimes we start asking ourselves the question. In fact, there's people sitting on the pews this morning. You've asked yourself this question. I'm so insignificant. What can God make out of me? I feel so unworthy. 
of God's touch. What could God possibly make out of me? Just a rank sinner. What does God see in me? An alcoholic. What does God see in me? Just an old drug addict. Huh? I'm just insignificant. I don't, I don't mount to very much. Amen. I don't know. Looks to me like they're doing a good job cleaning around here. But I do see a few specks of dust. Amen. I say I do I see a little bit of dust. Which is what God made man out of. Huh? When you and I see dust, we don't think much of it. It's just so insignificant. It's like the preacher getting up on Sunday morning, he's preaching about man coming from the dust of the earth, and to dust he shall return. And the little boy went home from Sunday school that day and was playing in his bedroom and come screaming out of his bedroom and said, Mama, Mama, there's a man under my bed. He said, I just don't know if he's coming or going. <laughs> Hallelujah. Dust, it don't mean much. But when God began to make man, he made him from the dust of the earth. And when you and I look at dust, we don't see much. But what did God see? When God looked at dust, he saw 217 bones. He saw 650 plus muscles. He saw 78 organs. He saw 60 to 100,000 miles of blood vessels. He saw 7 trillion nerves and 20 to 25 feet of intestines. He saw a brain that would contain 100 billion neurons where information would pass between the neurons at 250 miles per hour. I'm going to tell you, friend, God's able to see things that you and I can't see. God's able to see in you what you cannot see in yourself. Woo, hallelujah. You might say, oh, God can see a sin and iniquity. Oh, no, friend, you got to understand that. There's an old song, not an old song, but a song that's not very many years old that said, he saw me not for what I was, but for what I could be. When God looks at you, God sees more than a sinner. He sees a worshiper. He sees a saint. He sees a preacher. He sees a missionary. He sees a Sunday school teacher. He sees an usher. He sees a musician. He sees a praise singer. Huh? Amen. We've got 5,000 men beside women and children that need something to eat. What do you have? Lord, all we got is five loaves and two fishes. And what's that among so many? They saw five loaves and two fishes. That wasn't enough. But when Jesus looked at 5, 000, five loaves and two fishes, he saw a banquet for 5,000 men beside women and children. Amen. What are you talking about? I'm talking about the essentiality of church. Amen. There's a trait. There's a trait in the church that says it doesn't matter where you come from. You got a place here. It doesn't matter what your life has been. You got a place here. Amen. No matter what you feel like you have done, wherever you feel like you've gone, there's a place here. There's a place here. There's a place. Praise the Lord. I hope we got some folks sitting at home this morning chomping at the bit saying, I can't wait till I get to the house of worship tonight. When I get there, I'm going to do myself a little Holy Ghost jig. Well, why don't you just go ahead and practice at home this morning before you ever get here tonight? Hallelujah. Why don't you just go ahead and make a place in the living room right now and start lifting your voice and praising and magnifying your God and saying, when I get to church, this is what I'm going to do when I get to the house of worship tonight. My soul longs, my soul craves, my heart faints. Let's stand, let's stand. I'm telling you, friend, there's something happening in the Holy Ghost around here. I said, there's something happening in the Holy Ghost around here. 
I've come to tell somebody in this place, amen, no matter where you've been, no matter what you've gone through, no matter what your life is, it doesn't matter if you feel like your life has been shattered into a million pieces. The potter knows how to put you back together again. If you let Jesus get his hand on your life. If you let Jesus touch you. He'll start putting you back together. You see, I find places in the New Testament that when Jesus prayed for people, it uses this terminology. He made them whole, complete. Huh? He didn't just heal their illness. He didn't just heal their disease. He made them whole. I applaud the efforts of anybody and everybody that does everything they can to help people. But I'm going to tell you what, friend, the highest of education and the best of, uh, 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 of intentions can only go so far. There's only one that can make you whole. There's only one that can make you complete. That's why the preacher in writing to the church at Colossae said, you are complete in him. You are complete in him. Amen. There's something that's in this house this morning that calls you from wherever you've been. The swallow searching for a place that she could build a nest. Amen. The swallow flying, searching. And I'm sure the swallow looked at this place and said, that's not conducive and that's not the good place and that's not a right place. But when the swallow came into the house of God, she found the altar and she built a nest because she said, this is a place that I feel safe to bring my babies. The church is a safe place. The church is a safe place. One of the traits of the church is a safe place to come to. It's a safe place to raise your children. It's a safe place to bring your babies. It's a place where you can be assured that what they're going to need in life, they're going to receive it here. Amen. I, I know that there's so many restrictions and I'm new here and I'm not sure what all the protocol is. I know some, but I'm just going to, if you feel like that this is where you want to build your nest, where you want to establish your life, that you realize that really and truthfully, no other place offers for me to me what I need but this place these altars are open for you if you don't feel comfortable coming because of the present circumstance the present distress you can remain in your seat but we'll be praying for you but if this is the place where you feel is the place for you to come and find some peace and some contentment to have a restoration of your joy I really feel like there's some folks here this morning that ought to that ought to find a place to pray and say I'll never take the house of God for granted again Lord Lord repair the bell that's in my heart I don't want the bell to ever go silent. I don't want the call to worship to ever go silent. 
I don't want the call to worship to ever go silent. I don't want the call to prayer to ever go silent. I want there to be a holy appetite in my heart and in my mind and in my life. No place I'd rather be. No place I'd rather be. Hearing your love. No place I'd rather be. No place I'd rather be. No place, no place. No place I'd rather be. Than hearing your love. Hearing your love. No place I'd rather be. Come on now, church. No place I'd rather be. Reach out. Somebody pray. No place. Somebody pray right now. Somebody pray.